Welcome everyone to today's panel discussion on chem and big tech. My name is Laurent Dujambri. I'm the Assistant Dean of College Relations and Development here at the College of Chemistry at UC Berkeley. Today's panel discussion is part of the Berkeley Ecosystems, a new initiative that we've just launched to help you learn, explore, and connect with Berkeley faculty, alumni, students, and industry innovators. Our next event will be Wednesday, February 24th at 11 a.m. And it's a panel discussion on diversity, equity, inclusion, and STEM. And we would really appreciate if you rejoined us for that one, where we'll be facilitated by our Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion at the College of Chemistry, Professor Ann Berenger. We invite you to learn more about Berkeley Ecosystems at ecosystems.berkeley.edu. Now for a few logistical matters regarding today's discussion. Uh, today's discussion will be recorded and we will have a Q&A session at the end of the uh, talk. So please use the Q&A function, not the chat function to share thoughts or pose any questions to our panelists. And finally, directly following this event today, we'll receive, you'll receive a short survey. Please take two minutes to feed to, to provide us feedback on today's discussion, but also to provide us input on future topics that may be of interest to you. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's panel discussion on chemistry and big tech and our discussion facilitator, Steve Shimana. Steve currently teaches in the Masters in Product Development Program, which is a program in the Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering Department here at the College of Chemistry at UC Berkeley. He also consults startup companies in a variety of areas, including new process, process technology and materials, and previously had an extensive career at Chevron in research and development. Thank you, Steve, for agreeing to participate in our panel discussion today, both as our panel uh, panelists and facilitator, and I'll hand things over to you. Lauren, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce the, uh, the panel that we've assembled for uh, th this morning's discussion. Um, let me introduce uh, June Yang. Uh, June is the current uh, VP and General Manager for Computing at Google Cloud. Uh, she holds an MS from uh, Stanford uh, the Graduate School of Business and a, uh, an MS from the, I believe in Chemical Engineering from, from Berkeley. Uh, Laura Oliphant is an experienced CEO, board member, and venture capital investor. And she received her PhD in Chemical Engineering uh, from UC Berkeley. And uh, finally, Michael Vavoda, uh, our third panelist, currently serves as head of operations for Apple's audio division. And he received his PhD in chemical engineering from UC Berkeley. So there's a theme here of lots of chemical engineers. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to start the discussion. And uh, as Lowe mentioned, over the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to talk about some prepared topics. And then uh, we'll be collecting all your questions and then we'll uh, start moving in, into those. So um, let me just start with the, the, the first two topic areas around artificial intelligence, uh, big data and data analysis. So in recent years, artificial intelligence, AI and machine learning have really advanced a myriad of industries. And the question is, how is AI currently impacting your work and the industry. And, and a, a parallel to that, because it's intimately involved, is around big data and data analysis. So we all understand that data is crucial for strategic decision making and business planning. And so the question is, how do your companies use data science to create models that give insight into a product and customer behavior and market changes? And, and to start this off, I'm going to go to, to uh, June first uh, on, on her thoughts on this. And so June, in no particular order, um, uh, could you could you start us off on on one of those? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Steve, for the question. Um, so I think uh, I'll talk a little bit about my current job from Google Cloud perspective. How we're using you know big data both for our internal operational needs as well as kind of how what services we're providing to the external customers. Um, so if you look at internally, we you know Google Cloud uses you know kind of big data in a variety of ways. Um, so, for example, like I own the compute business, which is means that we're providing, you know, really servers as as a, as a, you know virtual machines and so forth as a, as a you know service to customers. 
And so that means behind the scenes, we're running you know, millions and millions of servers in you know, hundreds of data centers across the world. And to provide that kind of service uh, for people's compute and data uh, storage needs and so forth. So we use uh, you know, a lot, we collect a ton of data internally as we run these uh, you know, very, very large scale uh, data center. Right? So one of the things we talk about when we monitor our data, it's really from chip to chiller. Right? So chip, uh, the chip level at the CPU, GPU level, how we're measuring the usage of that. And then we think about monitoring, uh, you know, the physical data center, me me measuring the power, the cooling, all of those things are measured. And as we get those data, we can look for patterns and looking for ways to optimize our data center efficiency. Uh, when we think about the data center, I mean, a huge amount of power is actually coming out of uh, just, it's really a power usage, right? And, uh, and the, the, a lot of the power actually goes into the cooling part, right? So let me just take that one as one example. And this is an area like Google has just continually made a ton of progress based on the data that we have. And so our data center is running probably seven, eight, 10 times more efficient than a regular data center. So we're consuming way less power and still providing the same level of compute tendencies. That's a huge thing that, you know, that both saves cost for, for our perspective and also from a sustainability perspective. So that's just one example, how we're using data uh, really for the benefit, uh, you know, for, for, you know, for the company and also for our business and for our customers as well. Uh, externally, you know, Google is really known for, you know, a lot of our data, you know, data science tools, our AI and ML learning algorithms and tooling and for customers. So we really have a ton of customers, you know, whether it's from the automotive industry looking at autopiloting and or from, uh, you know, healthcare services looking at ways to be able to optimize their, you know, drug designs and simulations and so forth. And it's really providing tremendous amount of value. And uh, you know, for my part, you know, we provide really the plumbing for it, right? How do we get the GPUs? How do we get the, the TPUs capabilities to customers on that front? So that's just a quick uh, sort of view in terms of how we're using data uh, from my job and my uh, my company's perspective. Uh, thank you, my Michael. Uh, can you weigh in weigh in on this one? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, and and perhaps I can speak to this from a bit of a manufacturing standpoint, taking it away from from the customer side, but into how do we use this in our uh, big data in our supply chain? So um, let me speak a little bit about how we use big data in, in, in manufacturing, specifically what we do at Apple right now. I'm, I'm involved with assembly of consumer electronics and we use big data to aggregate um, information along our assembly supply chain to improve yields, improve quality. For example, we do a whole series of automated inspection steps, for example, as um, something we're building is being created uh, in my world, AirPods. And, the, uh, and cameras pick up minute changes, for example, in screw placement or something as, as minute as that. We correlate that to end of line yield. We correlate that to quality in the field. A huge amount of data is, is collected uh, with a, a lot of compute power in the back end that puts all of that together. At the end of the day, it helps us more rapidly drive up yields more quickly. It helps us ramp. Uh, more effectively as we're uh, as we're putting out a product, and it also helps to improve field quality more rapidly, which is is an enormous priority. So that, that's that's one of the ways that we're using big data and uh, machine learning in manufacturing. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, there's a a common perception, I, I guess, uh, with with some basis that that AI and machine learning uh, uh, are job killers. Uh, how how are uh, people thinking about this in terms of uh, the opposite and, and, and job creation or, 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 or not job killers? Well, I think that, that, um, that you can create better jobs. Um, I'm on the boards of, of, of um, Air Test Systems, which is a leader in Vernon, and I'm also on the board of Feasible, uh, which is located in Emeryville, which is doing battery metrology. And, and so Feasible in particular is creating a system by which you can check battery manufacturing while it's in the manufacturing process, and then you can predict how well it's going to perform. But, and again, there's also, there's, there's jobs in development, and these are all really good engineering jobs, not, not um, you know, minimum wage jobs that we're creating. So in many ways, you're creating some better jobs, but there is some cannibalization of the job, jobs, um, of lower paying jobs. Mm -hmm. the, the way I've seen it on, on the manufacturing side is, I think, similar to, to, to Laura's view. I, we're, we're accelerating the, the pace of a ramp and improving quality we're employing a lot of good engineers to develop algorithms and, and so on. 
uh, without really any downside in in the, in the assembly jobs and so on. As, as a yeah. matter of fact, if, and, if you're assisting then, product to success, yeah, go ahead. Look. And if you can accelerate yield, then you can do more designs. You have an explosion of designs exactly. going on right now. Exactly. That's exactly right. Hmm. Um, let me let me just. Uh, uh, because I think it, it pivots into something that, uh, that June brought up. And, and the next uh, thing I'd like to touch on, because I think it, it weighs in here, is on sustainability. Um, over the last decade, uh, society has, has become uh, a driving force in, in product development along with new technology in the market. And, and how do you see the world's growing concern over issues such as environmental impact, uh, uh, sustainability, you know, health and safety impacting uh, Product development, and, and and Michael, you you had some some thoughts along this line. I'd like to start with you uh, first, and then uh, uh, the others weigh in. I yeah, uh, um, again, a great question. It sustainability, and I'm speaking um, to a certain extent specific to what Apple does, but I, we we do see this, of course, across many many companies now. Um, we we take sustainability very seriously in in how we're both designing products and how we're managing our supply chain. So a couple of examples on the product design side, um, taking recycled materials very, very seriously, um, making sure that repairability of products is designed in from, from very early stages it's, and not an afterthought. For example, battery replacement that can be done at depot centers versus having to tear apart a piece of consumer electronics and, and, and put a lot of it in the landfill. Uh, that's a terrible outcome, and we we spend a lot of time on the on the PD side designing our way out of that. Um, the second aspect of this really is the supply chain itself. I think a lot of companies are are looking at their supply chains and demanding that their suppliers think about sustainability, whether it's their use of renewable energies, their use of energy efficient, efficiency along the way, not not just within the U.S. but really globally. Um, it's it's certainly the right thing to do, but but also, as uh, many of you probably know, there there is legislation coming into play here, that is requiring this circular economy laws in in Europe and so on that that are are simply mandating that products have more recyclability and repairability and, and such. So I think this is permeating every angle of of manufacturing now, and and of course a lot of other areas outside of manufacturing. June, you, you touched on something that, that reminded me many years ago, I, I was down at Stanford and I heard a talk by Eric Schmidt. And he, uh, he, he started this talk by showing what the first Google server looked like. And it looked like a computer box that had a bunch of boards stuck in it and it had a house fan in front of it. And then he showed the progression uh, up to modern day server farms. And he explained that he challenged the audience to say, what was the biggest engineering challenge uh, and all that. And everybody, of course, focused on the, the electronics. And he said, no, it was the fan in the front. And he says that the power consumption of these, nobody really anticipated the, uh, the continual power draw of all these and that cooling and, and uh, uh, managing power consumption. And, and the root of that was often uh, uh, around the basic chips. They just weren't designed for uh, low power use because nobody really ever thought of being all those together at one time. And so you mentioned that, that, you're, that, that Google is very conscious of this and, and its impact on sustainability. What, 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 what other things do you think about it in addition? Yeah, I think a, a lot of it. I mean, I think a part of this is also think about uh, safety, right? So for example, when we run millions and millions of servers and you know, have thousands, hundreds of thousands of servers in the same data center, the amount of heat it generates it's unfathomable. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you are actually not careful, we, we do actually very careful thermal analysis and to understand how much heat is putting out there. And uh, yeah, I see Laura's uh, nodding her head probably from Intel days, I'm sure she's gonna do quite a bit of this. And then when you do it at such a scale, right? You have to really think about, okay, how do I dissipate a power? We have, you know, places where we have to run liquid cooling, uh, you know, for some of our really high powered, uh, you know, kind of chipset, it has to be <clears> liquid cooled uh, because the, uh, the air cool just isn't sufficient, right? And this also very much ties into the sustainability question you were asking earlier. 
that you know so much of the data you know sort of the power usage is actually coming from a cooling side um, so we're very cognizant about you know how do we optimize our cooling things and we also when we build data centers we look at that particular location to say what is the optimal way for us to cool the data center um, mm -hmm. so for example like one of the data center we have is in Finland it's actually used to be a paper mill and it's sitting right next to the ocean and uh, the ocean temperature is about 14 degrees Celsius e e year round. So we're using seawater as a cooling mechanism to cool, uh, to cool the overall data center. And that was much more, um, even though it's a much harder problem than just turn on air conditioning, um, but it's much more from a sustainability perspective. It's much more favorable uh, from that perspective. So there are places where we chose to you know, go down a certain path, uh, even at a higher cost or longer time frame and more challenging, but it's, it's, a, it's a better for the long term in terms of the sustainability side. And I don't know if people know this, but Google is actually the largest uh, purchaser of renewable powers. Wow. And uh, from you know 2017 onwards, we have been carbon neutral uh, in all the data center and you know, operations and so forth. And this is something that you know Google overall takes very care, uh, takes great you know kind of pride and takes great care of. And Google Cloud is part of the Google. You know we also do our part in that uh, in that area. Well, so that. That will lead into another topic uh, in a mm -hmm. moment, but uh, since you've touched on it, uh, Google is uh, a large user of, uh, of renewable energy. So what, what is being done then along the lines of uh, grid scale energy storage so that you can run you know, at night as well as during the day? So are there big uh, efforts along those lines? So that unfortunately is out, outside of my area expertise. So I don't have a whole lot of uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of insights to share. Maybe some of the other panelists have more information on that. Any thoughts from the, the other panelists um, uh, on this renewable question and being able to, to uh, deal with the intermittency questions? I'm not sure about the renewables, but on the sustainability, I know at Airtest and at Feasible, we are are designing our tools to be environmentally sustainable. Um, moving up a level on the corporate side, um, we are um, very involved with ESG. Uh, we are maintaining a diverse workforce uh, in both cases. And both, both, both companies have metrics um, around that. Um, and, and so we're very concerned about the environmental aspects in both companies. Mm -hmm. Steve, we are we are rolling out um, energy storage as much as we can at uh, so for, for example at Apple Park you probably know there's there it's completely solar array powered and there, there is a lot of, of storage that, that goes along with that to handle that in intermittency it's it's early days as we all know for for effective storage um, but but I think we're we're getting started as as quickly as we can on that mm -hmm. well maybe uh, tying this back to the uh, the big data and, and, and data analysis. Um, uh, you, you touched on, I, I think, uh, Michael, you touched on uh, some some of the things that you're doing. But the the the, the question was um, uh, that had been posed was how is data science used to create models and give insight into uh, product development and customer behavior and market changes? How how is uh, uh, and this is more of an, I guess, an IT question than a, than a uh, hard tech question, but it's how, how, is, how is that being used to um, provide the insights for what's needed mm -hmm. in the future? There, there are definitely angles of customer behavior that we do use to inform future product design. Not, not going into too, too many details that, that, that uh, I really can't, but you, you can imagine that with with network devices, you can you can look at customer behavior and you can look at how often they're swiping this way versus that way and use models and aggregating all of that data and informing future design. Uh, even issues like comfort, where you can you can track uh, consumer behavior and that can even inform elements along those lines. So th there's more and more of that. The, the time I've been in this industry I've, I've, industry, I've seen much more rapid and effective adoption of, of uh, that sort of information, even into product design and, and informing very early on. Uh, the last thing we want to do is AC customer complaints afterwards because of something that we could have informed more effectively, but also it, it does, it accelerates product development and getting it out into the market more quickly when 
uh, as you go as we go through prototype testing and and, and rollouts, you you're you're essentially validating some of those assum assumptions as opposed to having to do some respins uh, along the way. So it's it's really affecting all of those areas. Okay. Um, so considering this is a uh, you know the College of Chemistry, uh, I think this this <laughs> this next topic is is uh, most relevant. It's around hard tech and and tough tech. Mm -hmm. uh, Product innovations based on the chemical material sciences have the potential to create new industries with new jobs, but typically require longer development times and patient capital to get them commercialized. And so the, the question is, what, what are some ideas to improve and enhance the innovation ecosystem to reduce the cycle time and increase the success rate in, in hard tech? So, uh, Laura, let me, let me start with you on this one. Yeah, so the hard tech problem has been, been around for a while. Um, Basically, about 20 years ago, a lot of a lot of venture capital firms were very into hard tech. That decreased in popularity from about 2008 to about 2016, uh, and it became as an investor in Intel Capital it became very very difficult to find cooperative co-investors. Um, more recently, there's been a lot of governments that have been getting involved. Uh, the EU um, has established a very significant fund for hard tech. There's been a number of funds um, established in the U.S. Um, a lot of people are, are getting involved in the incubators, um, the engine for one. You have Cyclotron Road. You have Skydeck. Um, all have established specific hard tech tracks uh, for those people who want to do innovation in the hard tech, um, in material science. And that, that's included material science engineering, basic engineering. Um, feasible, uh, for example, as a graduate of the Cyclotron Road Program. And Feasible is a company that is creating an ultrasound uh, metrology system for batteries while they're in manufacture. So that's classic hard tech. And again, we're, um, we're, seek we're you know, we've had investors from, uh, you know, we have major customers, we have investors from, uh, from all over the world. Now, one thing is that the Chinese have put in a lot of money on this. They, have, they had something like a $40 billion fund that was devoted to hard tech. And I think one of the pr priorities of the Biden administration needs to be to establish something similar. So, um, uh, June, I think you had uh, so, some thoughts on on this one as well. Um, and, and maybe uh, let me just add another piece in here, which is around there are good ideas, and then there's money, and and connecting these up, and and taking the good ideas and de-risking them, and even finding them and connecting them up, uh, which is I guess part of the ecosystem. Uh, and how to make all that work better. So June, let me, yeah. let me. Uh... I, I just, could I just jump in sure. on one, one thing before you go to June? Yeah. Um, in the College of Chemistry, I think we're very, very lucky to have the Berkeley Catalyst Fund um, uh, run by Laura Smoliar. And so they are a key element in being able to fully commercialize technologies. Good plug. Yes, I, 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 I forgot to mention that. Thank you very much. Yeah. June. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I think that this uh, this hard tech and tough tech is not only for on the chemistry on the chemistry and material science area, right? I mean, this is true in other areas as well. Uh, even if you look on the you know kind of on the IT information technology front, there is actually a lot of hard and basic science problems that we have to solve as well, and uh, it does re require patient capital, right? So if I look at sort of Google, right? Google has a research arm, and that's actually with billions of dollars of funding. That's actually looking at these very longer, more basic problems, and does require you know both capital and patience to kind of for those payoff. Uh, so, for example, you know quantum computing, right? That's something that's been in the works for you know 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. and it's just barely hitting you know uh, you know a very low level of commercialization at this point. Um, I think, you know, I totally agree with Laura's point. Some of these things, I think, needs to be coming from the, you know, from the government organization. And then we're also seeing some of the trend with the large technology companies who are, you know, realizing there's a void uh, in terms of the basic science development and so forth. And, you know, I do see, you know, some of these uh, larger companies are putting together, you know, their own research labs and the research and yeah. stability money to pay off, you know, these things are not going to pay off today. They're going to be paying off, you know, five, 10 years down the line. And it does require, you know, sort of having sufficient deep pocket and sufficient, you know, foresight and to kind of sustain that level. Um, but it is critical, you know, as we think about the long run uh, to make sure that, you know, we have these technology we can capitalize on. Um, I think to your other point, Steve mentioned about, you know, commercialization, right? Um, so this is something, you know, I would say, you know, I do this on a smaller scale with my, uh, you know, with my portfolio as my, uh, you know, kind of my uh, area as well. You know, I always have a, a you know, small pocket of funding that goes into exploration incubation areas where we're looking at these more moonshot projects that has a high, high risk and high return, 
uh, as well. And then there's a graduation process, right? Like you look at these things and to see if it can be riskless. And then if you can risk a certain level, then we'll sort of increase the funding and then take it down to a next level rather than just kind of an like incubation and as an experiment. Um, so there's a series of things. I think there's this process that we need to, like, you know, people can do to really uh, be able to, uh, you know, bubble up sort of the, the higher potential ones and hopefully getting those to market uh, in a shorter amount of time. For, for companies, um, the universities and the local incubators, places like Skydeck, uh, Cyclotron Road, are an integral part of their, um, their innovation ecosystem. Well, to, to that, that point, uh, June is almost describing the, the uh, re, re, reassurgence of uh, uh, what used to be uh, corporate R&D departments mm -hmm. that, right. that, that uh, kind of went away, you know, with, uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, but I think you're describing to some extent that, that coming back. I, and, and, and with that, you know, I, I remember in the you know, 70s and 80s about, uh, at least in the chemical engineering department, there was a peak at one point where about 40% of the uh, graduate research was funded by industry. And then mm -hmm. that, it, it plummeted. Uh, um, but so this then ties to where do ideas come from and, and how, do they, how do they get integrated and picked up? Um, so, so for instance, uh, Laura or June, you, you mentioned that uh, you, you, you fund these, these uh, exploratory things. Do you go out looking in certain areas? How do you connect up uh, people and ideas with things that are of interest to your company? So I, I can jump in on this one and the, uh, on this one. So I think uh, one is that we look within, right? Uh, Google Cloud is a very big, uh, large organization already. And so we do have, you know, have processes where people can apply essentially for this innovation fund, right? To kind of, uh, um, mm -hmm. and then we do a vetting process to kind of pick these ones we think has a probably higher potential and is solving the right set of problem that we're interested in and have, you know, kind of those, uh, those kind of funded and they can start kind of working on this incubation and exploration area. Um, and I think, you know, we, there, there's, a, you know, I think Silicon Valley has a great culture of startup entrepreneurial. And so certainly there's plenty of uh, startups out there that's continued to pitch to angel fund, angel fund, to VCs and so forth. I'm sure Laura sees that on, on her, you know, day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some of them, you know, kind of, some of them, you know, go through a, 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 a you know, kind of a, a, a process of kind of maturity and uh, uh, some of them bubble to the top and others don't, right? Um, but I think it's a, it's a healthy kind of a Darwinian system, uh, mm -hmm. the survival of the fittest to kind of go through the, go through the, the you know, get funded and that they can have a chance to pursue. Yeah, definitely. Um, I left Intel almost five years ago, but um, when I was with Intel Capital, uh, we were known as the eyes and ears of Intel. And so part of our job was to go out and look for new technologies and try and connect them with internal technologists who hadn't seen us. And it was alongside all other ways of doing that. We have, of course, had university relationships and, and Intel, of course, still does have those relationships. So, uh, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. All right, go, go ahead, Michael. But tie, tying along to that point, I think uh, there's definitely something to be said about uh, larger companies that are that are using M and A to &A, yeah. yeah to seek ideation and then mm -hmm. and then taking what is market feasible and then using their their capital to to really take mm -hmm. it uh, to take it forward. I know all the large companies we we've worked were very active in that area. I wanted to make sure we didn't forget that. Oh yeah, no, good, great point because that's an essential part of the open innovation system. So th thinking back to the the question about enhancing the the innovation ecosystem uh, and. Re reducing the cycle time and increasing the success rate. So, what, what do you think are the the the, the barriers to that that you could remove that makes all this work better? Is it uh, uh, a scarcity of new ideas? Is it uh, they haven't been de-risked properly to the point where you're interested in? Is it um, just being aware of them? Uh, it didn't sound like there was a complete money side problem. So, if you had to, to tune all this up. Uh, and make it better, where, where would you focus? Well, so let me start there. So I think Berkeley's got a great innovation ecosystem. Um, you have Skydeck, you have Citrus, you have Cyclotron Road, you have 20 other incubators. I could name a few more if I wanted to. I think having the single point of contact and being encouraged to commercial, fully commercialize technology, and there's a huge impact to that. You're creating jobs, 
um, you're, you're advancing society. And, and, and so encouraging the culture of commercializing technology at the university level, I think would be really helpful to, uh, uh, to get ideas out. And not all the ideas will succeed. I mean, there, that's another cultural thing. Maybe you don't, maybe you're not successful. And, but you know, as a young person embarking on your career, you learn a ton being in a startup, being a CEO of a startup and, and or being, being in a startup in general, you just learn a ton. And, and it enhances your career, future career for sure. Yeah, I'll chime in here. I mean, I'll talk about it more from the angle, you know, like, uh, you know, looking at, you know, okay, what, what are the technologies that, uh, you know, I would be interested in, in terms of commercializing and so forth, right? So if I look at um, uh, uh, the type of uh, sort of, uh, you know, startups or, you know, kind of people starting doing their own exploration ideas and so forth, sometimes I see a disconnect, right? There's an interesting piece of technology, but you have to find an interesting problem that's a right, yeah. the technology is the right solution for. That's when you have the product market fit. That's when it becomes interesting to me to say, okay, I, I'm interested in investing in this. I'm interested in taking this to market, right? Mm -hmm. If it's just a tech, piece of technology, um, that's, you know, for me, that would not be interesting because I can't find a commercialization opportunity for that. Um, so I think just really thinking about, you know, trying to connect the technology with a you know opportunity or problem that you can solve and really looking for that product market fit. I think that's fundamental. Um, mm -hmm. So in some of these startups I've seen, like there is a technology, you know, there, there are people who are really good at technologists, but there's really not necessarily a market view in terms of what is a market problem we can solve. And that's when the sort of these the technology sort of like lingers around because you haven't figured out where, you know, where's a good market product market fit. Um, the second thing I would say is I, I think I see uh, like technology where people are thinking, well, it could be this, this, or this and that, right? It could be so many different things. Um, I think for most technology, you sort of have to think about what is your focus and beachhead you mm -hmm. want to establish mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. yeah. and so that you actually get some traction. Then you can think about how do I expand? Uh, too often with startups, what I've seen is that you know, they try to do too many things. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and then, you know, especially your startup, you've got 10 people, right? You can focus maybe on one thing. And you got to be very careful of picking that right one thing that's going to give you that beachhead. Um, so those are kind of probably my two cents on things that people can do um, to really kind of increase the, the likelihood of, uh, you know, the startup, the ideas and, uh, you know, getting those to commercialization. And again, on the Berkeley campus, I can't emphasize enough that you, there's great resources for figuring out that product market fit. That, um, you know, you're in the college of chemistry, um, right, you know, down 100 feet away from you is the, is the School of Business. Um, collaborate with the students in the School of Business. There's the Berkeley Center, the Berkeley House Center for Entrepreneurship right on the Berkeley campus. Uh, people like me come in and mentor startups will give you frank opinions of what your ideas are. Um, we're not you know, judging you, we're just giving you inputs. Um, so there's a lot of great resources on the Berkeley campus for commercializing technologies. And if you're a young student, if you're thinking of doing this, go for it. Yeah, sure. when I, so just one more thing. Um, so sure. when I was in Berkeley, I actually participated, there was a management of technology program, which was a yeah. joint program between, uh, you know, the college engineering chemistry, as well as uh, with uh, the uh, college of business. And I thought that was a great, uh, you know, sort of combination trying to bring the two worlds together. And if that program, I think it's still around, if folks, uh, you know, if you're, you know, at, uh, in school still at Berkeley, uh, I, I definitely encourage you folks to kind of check that out. So, so June, I just wanted to, to emphasize something you said I think was really important is that uh, the, the idea of access to the problem, um, that, that, I, that I think is a, a probably one of the, uh, the things that, that can be improved is to connect up, uh, you know, what the problems are of, of interest, unless you have, you know, ongoing relationships with, you know, people like yourself that, that would hear about such things is, you know, you, you have to imagine them or read about them. So that's probably one area that... Uh, could be improved, but I want to switch to another topic here. Uh, it's a very timely topic, um, and uh, uh, and this was around COVID. Uh, and the question is, what have we learned from the COVID nineteen global pandemic, and how it has affected the industry as a whole, um, both you know plus and minus, and 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 uh, and what what we can do to make uh, future uh, events uh, better. So. Uh, uh, Michael, let, let me let me start with you on this one. Yeah, I I think what what we have not learned is that we're more interconnected. We 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 already knew all of that. I think what this has shown us is it doesn't take much to really stress the robustness of 
how that interconnection happens and the supply chains that, that are out there. Uh, when I think about the disruptions and, and we, we all read about this when COVID's impact was very starting to be very pronounced in the, the first end of first quarter of last year, manufacturing, for example, was grinding to a halt all over the world because no one had really planned for something like COVID. So I think the lesson that it's taught many of us is we need to really think about hardening those supply chains. What happens when we can't travel? What happens when uh, a manufacturing site in one region is shut down for some amount of time? How do you, how do you react to that? And how do you manage uh, your, your, your supply chains to react? Uh, that, that, that was really the main lesson that, that I learned coming out of this and uh, what's taken up a lot of my, my thought over the last year and, and frankly remedying that and hardening things for the future. Yeah, I think I'll also add to that. I mean, I think uh, I, th I totally agree with, uh, you know, kind of uh, the first quarter, everything on the supply chain, you know, if it's hardware, it's really grinding to the halt. I think I was also very surprised to see how quickly uh, it also recovered the resiliency in the system um, and also just resiliency of the people and uh, the type of uh, innovation people put in uh, to actually still deliver, right? Um, so for example, like I was rolling out a brand new service, a new product, um, and we had to roll out in 10 different regions across the world. And this is actually not just kind of me rolling out our software portion. This actually has to be the hardware. Like we have to get the hardware, you know, to these different regions. We have to install in the data center and so forth. And I was actually very, very happy to see that, you know, people really just uh, very scrappy, figured out how do we solve this problem? And we were able to deliver, you know, the 10 regions really pretty much on time, despite all the delays with the, you know, with the, um, uh, with COVID, with the supply chain, and also was this difficult with social distancing and just having difficult to actually get enough people into the data center uh, to work. Um, so those are things that I was, uh, you know, really surprised and very pleased to see that, uh, you know, the level of innovation and creativity people put in. Mm -hmm. Well, bo both Michael and, and, and June, your both your companies make make things. They they make uh, hardware things. Um, so, and and you you talked about the stressing of supply chains. So this means you couldn't get uh, potentially materials. Um, either finished product or raw materials from, from abroad. So does this impact uh, 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 where things are made in the future? Yeah, I think um, speaking from the board perspective, I'm just gonna jump in here. Um, we have to make sure that there's resili resiliency in the supply chain. Exactly. And at both Bessie and Air, we're, we're very, very active on doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, resiliency is the perfect word for for how we're we're approaching it too. Whether it's it's making sure that there is the adequate amount of multi sourcing, um, and 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 thinking about those sorts of things exactly. And and I guess maybe uh, to just wrap up this this particular topic is uh, we we rapidly realized that uh, uh, we had no ability to make you know basic PPE. Uh, <laughs> And, and that, that what we made maybe wasn't adequate. Um, but these are products that are based on material science and, and manufacturing. So uh, you know, that, that's an obvious one that, that you know, might, uh, might change in the future. But are there other opportunities that, have, that you, know, you ha wouldn't even have thought about before in your, in your companies that you know, wh where there's a problem, there's an opportunity that, that just didn't exist before? It's a tough question. <laughs> yeah, I need a noodle on that one. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll tell you what. Um, uh, we, we've gotten to our, our 40 minutes. And so um, uh, to keep on the script, we're uh, to look at some of the questions that have come in. And um, uh, I, I'm, I'm looking at uh, some here. And uh, ah, I, I see one from a former student, Alex Chung. Uh, and Alex noticed that all the panelists uh, here uh, ended up in fields that were very different from uh, classical chemical engineering. So he says, how did the panelists navigate their early careers working in fields very different from chemical engineering? Uh, what skills or tools did they use to, to earn trust with their coworkers that had uh, deeper and longer domain expertise? That's an excellent question. I, I can, I can start. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I can take a, I can take a little one here. I, I, uh, I started off in the semiconductor industry as a process engineer. And so there actually wasn't a very, very large departure 
uh, it was it was plasma related work. And so I thought about material balances and I thought about fluid flow and so on. Yes, it was plasma. It's, it's, it's a different kind of fluid flow. Um, so those thought processes and, and what I learned in school certainly did apply. I think what what was most relevant, though, was was the ability to approach data analysis in a very rigorous way. I, th those skills are so transferable that coming out of chemical engineering, I thought was a, a, a just the right background for branching out into, into those sort of adjacent areas. And, and yes, then of course, there's a little bit of Brownian motion that perhaps takes you into operations and so on that many of us did and, and, and branched out. But I, I think that, that chemical engineering does provide, background does provide such a great basis for what we then went out and did later. Yeah, I would agree with that. The uh, chemical engineering, you learn to think very, very well. Uh, I too, started off as a technologist. I spent four years in the development lab at Intel. And then I went further and further over into the so-called dark side. So I, I went from there, I went to the supplier development program at Intel and I managed, I managed technology programs. Uh, and then I, um, I then went over to the venture capital side, which is totally different. And so when I first started in, as a VC, and by the way, my background was not at all unusual for being in VC at the time. A lot of uh, the, the major VCs in the Silicon Valley have doctorates in engineering or sciences. Uh, and a lot of, uh, you know, major, major, you know, technology pioneers have doctorates. I mean, Sergey and uh, Google founders, uh, Larry, Larry both have um, doctorates. Um, all the, all the, um, all the founders of Intel had doctorates in engineering. Andy Grove, of course, was a chemical engineer. He worked in Gilman, I believe, um, mm -hmm. and he used to see Berkeley. And so my background wasn't at all unusual for venture capital, um, but I didn't know the first thing about finance when I started <laughs> Intel. I, I remember my first meeting with a, my, my, my finance guy and I was asked him a stupid question, just looked at me like, we hired you. <laughs> and so I had to take a lot of classes and I had to, uh, I had to build that credibility over time, just making good decisions on technology and technology based. <laughs> You know, and, you know, obviously the deters into operations, again, once you know how to think and know how to approach problems, it's makes, it makes it a lot easier. And of course, now I'm, I'm making my career on boards mostly. And so seeing things strategically um, is, is invaluable. Yeah, I think I definitely want to echo my panelists, right? I think, you know, with uh, chemical engineering and just like coming coming from engineering background, are right? you really learn the ability to think and yeah. ability to learn, right? Those are fundamental, right? Like in the high tech world, the, the problems, the things are moving so quickly, right? And uh, we're always learning something new and nobody has all the answers. Um, so your ability to be able to learn and connecting the dots and to be able to break down a prop particular problem and uh, to be able to, you know, kind of offer and connecting the dots and synthesize the problem and then be able to articulate and uh, what, you know, what the direction you want to take the product with or, you know, directing uh, to, you know, to make investment on investment. These things are so transferable to whatever industry that you're in that if you have these basic, uh, you know, kind of really analytical and communication skills, I think, you know, it's, it's really, you can go anywhere you want. Okay, uh, let me, I, I have another, actually a bunch of questions here. Um, uh, oh, this is one from uh, uh, former colleague, uh, Georgie Sherman. And Georgie asks, uh, this is an AI type question. Uh, could you comment on centralizing AI infrastructure and people versus dispersing infrastructure and people. What are the advantages and risks of each approach? I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. Can you read the question again? Centralized okay. AI versus decentralized AI? Yeah, so this is, is AI, I guess, has you know, the, the, the ability to, uh, you, you, could, you could do everything in one spot mm -hmm. or you could, have a dispersed infrastructure and people that are uh, uh, doing, uh, rather than centralize uh, analysis and decision-making, have it dispersed. And, and she was, uh, George is asking, do you see any advantages or, or disadvantages of, of either approach? Okay, this kind of goes back to earlier, we talked about technology and the, the, pro the problem set, right? I think uh, it depends on the use case, right? And, uh, you know, for AI, so for example, if you look at very common, sort of very common model, right? Whereas, uh, you know, edge computing is uh, something that's very big, right? So whether in manufacturing, retail, or, you know, hospitals or the healthcare, you actually need sort of a ability to compute and do AI at the edge. 
at the same time, you also you know, need to do some central kind of things. So a very common thing you see is that people do inferences at the edge and where they can respond to the problems uh, that's coming up and be able to you know, kind of give a response. But a lot of the training data and the large scale modeling and so forth tend to be done centrally because it's more efficient uh, from a modeling and also you have a lot more data to do this. So I think it's not necessarily technology is good or bad. I think it depends on the use case and what's the best particular use case. Uh, it depends on the use case, uh, the technology mm -hmm. that fits that particular use case that yeah. gives you that best outcome. No, I, I was thinking exactly that. If we need to make decisions in the factory, we we need local compute essentially to to operate at speed. But when it's when it is that large scale modeling, um, that's that that is more. It makes sense that that's more centralized. And there also uh, there are potentially security issues at stake there too, where you want some of that in in very highly secure. Uh, centralized areas versus, for example, if you're using contract manufacturers, although you do everything you can to secure those sites, uh, it, they can they can be leaky. So we have to be careful. Great. Uh, uh, we have a question here from Emily Thompson. Um, she writes, on the life cycle of products, where's the driving legislation coming from for recyclability, reuse and flexibility laws? Is the U.S. driving any of this or is it more from... Uh, uh, internal choices your company makes are from other countries. So, and and she comments, for example, the right to repair push in Europe. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I was thinking when I mentioned it earlier. It's it's the circular economy right to repair laws that are that are in Europe that are that are helping to drive and and just like California uh, emission standards, they they tend to set. It, you, we won't design two products, one for Europe and one for not Europe. So it it does force alignment, I think, everywhere. Um, but yes, it, it is Europe that does seem to be driving. Uh, and But I, I will say, uh, certainly speaking personally at Apple, but I know elsewhere as well, it's also just the right thing to do. And there, a lot of the conversations we have are around that. What, what is the right thing to do here? Forget what the laws are. Oh. Yeah, I think there's a big push in the EU for um, for companies to engage in environmental safety and governance issues, or ESG, ESG is the acronym, uh, but the, the EU is very, very strong on that. Um, let me uh, pivot over to a, uh, an interesting one here around, um, uh, this is from uh, Jeff Wooten. He's, he asks, how and when do you think uh, that quantum computing will transform the technology industry and accelerate AI and machine learning in society. So this is a question around the impact of quantum computing. Yeah, I can take a crack at this. Um, sure. I think, you know, when I, yours. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I look at this, right, like, you know, I look at this from a more of a, uh, from a business and a product angle, right? Is there a sufficient, uh, you know, sort of a, a demand from the market, right, from a customer side? If a customer wants it, we'll provide that as a service. When I look at quantum computing, I think the ecosystem is still very, very early stages, right? Uh, there is not enough, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, both in terms of uh, the type of, uh, you know, algorithm and tooling and the software that kind of goes along with that. And there's not enough with that level of skills to really kind of uh, be able to uh, be able to use that properly. And then that sort of limits sort of the availability of kind of quantum computing and uh, in terms of access to quantum computing. I think it's still one of those, you know, moonshot things. It's early stages. Um, and I think if I'm, you know, if I'm a truly sort of com a large scale commercialization, I think it's still a number of years away. Okay. Um, okay, this is a, uh, uh, a big company dynamic type question. How does knowledge sharing and transfer work in such large companies to ensure that there's no duplication of efforts? <laughs> I can take a little bit of a stab no, at question. that. I, I think uh, a, a lot of large companies do try and set up centers of excellence that literally pull it. I know it's an overused term, but but I think it describes it actually quite well. Uh, we it is a huge risk of duplication of effort. So what I've seen happen effectively is you literally have someone that owns organizing centers of excellence. It is their job, and their job is to pull pull together uh, whether it's machine learning. Um, strategies across lines of business or something as seemingly banal as adhesive to, uh, glues. <laughs> you, what you don't want is someone building Max to um, go in a, a long glue development program when that's already been, that problem has already been solved over in the iPad division. So <laughs> you, you need to pull in teams like that and actually force those kinds of conversations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
that. So I'll just add to that. I mean, I think this is a common problem across all Irish companies, whether it's intentional, unintentional, <laughs> difficult uh, to, you know, to, 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 like, just because company is so big and the left hand doesn't know what right hand is doing, right? But I think Michael talked a little bit from a structural perspective. I think, you know, I think this also goes into, you know, both the cultural side and the tooling side, right? Culturally, I think if you have a sort of a culture of openness, transparency, and sharing, it becomes easier for people to find out, hey, you know, what are the things that you know other people are doing? And there's if it's just a culture of sharing, then people say, hey, you know, I want to, I don't want to reinvent the wheels. I want to leverage something else that's got. And that's not necessarily true across all the different companies. And I think the third thing I would say is just really in terms of tooling, right? If you make it like, you know, if you have like company-wide wiki or you know, the, the, you know, the document repository, you actually make it more open, then people actually find out because a lot of times you cannot manage this entirely centrally at the top, right? It's really yeah. at the bottom. <laughs> At the, at the bottom level, grassroots level, people are able to find, okay, X, uh, you know, two, you know, departments over are working on this and, uh, you know, is there something I can do? So I think it's really kind of a combination of, you know, organizational structure and, uh, you know, cultural and, uh, and also in terms of the tooling to, to kind of create that. Yeah. Ironically, one of the things I did in Intel Capital was to connect the different groups working on the same thing. <laughs> I once was looking at a deal where I found six groups at Intel that were working on the same thing. Mm. Well, so I, I, there's been a couple uh, uh, questions that have come in. They have a kind of a common theme. I guess the uh, people have noticed that there, uh, that we all there's all these advanced degrees in chemical engineering, but we've ended up in other fields. And uh, uh, so this is. Uh, I don't see a name attached to it. But what kind of research areas can one pursue in chemical engineering uh, for a PhD or graduate work to be able to work in uh, tech later? Well, so, you know, what you're doing is going to be 10 to 15 years in advance. I mean, my PhD thesis was in batteries. Uh, when, I went to, when I went to Intel, I swore I'd never look at a battery again. And I didn't until I joined the board of Feasible um, two years ago. Um, <laughs> and so again, it's you know doing research that will that will um, that will help you learn how to think and learn how to solve and define and solve problems. I don't think there's anything specific that you can do. You know. Yeah, I definitely concur with that. I mean, like uh, my graduate work was on catalysis, which really has nothing to do yeah. with <laughs> nothing right? to do with compute. <laughs> yeah. But I would say that you know the, what Laura talked about really the, the ability to kind of be able to learn and be able to think and break down problems. And uh, you know, I think if you add on top of that, that your ability to be able to communicate, right? I think again, if you can do all those things, you can do any job. That you know, go to different industries. It's it's not really limited by the specific domain. I think you yeah. can learn the domain. Um, but some of the other things, I think it's just really very transferable skill. Yeah. And when, when I graduated from, from, from Berkeley, I was going to say Intel for a second. When I graduated from Berkeley, <laughs> I keep on saying that, um, I, I, batteries were in the dumps. I mean, there were no jobs in batteries. And now batteries are like super hot. So uh, I have one, one question here. It, it actually uh, relates to a previous discussion, but I want to make sure I get it. So this is from, I read the name here. Uh, Thomas Guadagno, and he asked, can you talk about uh, how you help balance resilience in the supply chain with finding eco-conscious materials to build your products that may not be as robust as uh, the supply chains compared to the other traditional uh, materials? And how do you integrate these newer raw materials into your products, although there may be limited capacity at, at, at that given time? So it's you, you have an existing product, it works, it has, uh, you know, supply chains exist, but there's something that comes along and it could displace it, uh, but, uh, you know, you, you have to start big, you know, on day one to be able to supply all your needs. How, how do you phase in a, a new material with maybe non-existent supply lines? I think larger companies do have a bit of a responsibility to, to help invest in those areas. Uh, if, if it's a startup, for example, that has come up with a new material, uh, uh, environmentally friendly coating, for example, that displaces something that was polymer based. If, if you're someone like Apple that takes this seriously, uh, you need to spend a bit of time investing in this too. And, and uh, a lot of larger companies will co-invest in capital equipment and, and so on 
uh, to help that sort of thing along. I, I think that that is how a lot of big com companies do need to think about it as, as being a co-investor. Fair enough. Um, another person writes, I don't see a name here, uh, and I guess it's a theme from before, which was, um, I, I guess uh, everybody is transferred from a technical to a business role in a large company, for instance, to uh, in, in cases from process engineer to business manager. Uh, how did you prepare yourself to, to make that transition or was it just natural? It just happened. So um, when I transitioned to being a business manager, I, I, there was a large technical component to being that business manager. And so I, you know, I used to manage the activities of KLA and Tencor and, and now KLA and applied materials and, and other large companies, Nikon. And so you really needed to understand the technology in order to be able to properly manage the business. So there's a lot of transferable skills and the business parts you can pick up on the side. It's relatively easy. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I never set about it thinking I, I want to be a business manager yeah. or something someday. I think if, if you're successful on the technology side, especially in Silicon Valley, you'll ultimately have the opportunity to run a business. Yeah. And if, with that technical background, not, not to be glib, but you'll be completely fine. You'll pick up the, the, the rest of it. Um, and also the people management skills, which I think are a big part of it. Uh, yeah. You don't have to be an expert in everything, but you have to know how to ask the right questions and, uh, and motivate. I, I think that those are the more important skills. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. How did you learn that skill to ask the right questions? My, my PhD advisor threw me in the pool and told me to figure it out. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what happens when you get a doctorate. <laughs> no, I, I, exactly, exactly. Um, okay, there's one, I think I have quest, time for one last question here. It said, uh, uh, what can chemical engineering uh, bring to the current fight against the pandemic? For instance, could synthetic biology tools be harnessed to increase production of vaccines uh, to meet the global pandemic? Are there any such efforts in Berkeley being done uh, along these lines? I don't know if there's a short answer to this question, if anybody has any thoughts. Well, uh, I, I would just say that that the, I think this tools of synthetic biology, and maybe I don't understand this well enough, but I think they're already being used. And, uh, you know, if you think about the basic, um, what is the structure of this vaccine? It's not your conventional vaccine where they just weaken something. Uh, that actually would be too dangerous to actually put out into the generic population. But they've used, they've clipped up the, the COVID molecules, my understanding, and they made, they, they have used parts of the COVID molecule that will stimulate the, the immune system, which I think is relatively analogous to what you would do in synthetic, synthetic biology. Yeah, and I think, you know, chemical engineering and vaccine, I mean, in my first job out of college, I was actually working at Merck in vaccine production. Wow. <laughs> cool. Huh. So it's a, it's a very much a chemical engineering job, right? Like, yeah. how do you increase the process yield, right? How do you, like, do purification, uh, do fermentation at a much higher, you know, sort of, a, you give you much better consistent results and better yield? What kind of adjuvant do you use? I mean, these are all, like, combinations of, you know, kind of chemi chemical engineering, chemistry, oh, yeah. biology questions. Um, so I think there's ample, you know, like, you know, sort of uh, opportunities out there for chemical engineering to play a very, you know, important role in, in this uh, vaccine production and, uh, you know, kind of to control the pandemic. Excellent. All right. Well, at this point, um, I'd like to, to hand this back to, to Lo and, and, and let him uh, wrap it up. Um, thank you very much to the panel. It's been an excellent discussion. And I, I apologize for all the questions we couldn't get to, but uh, I think Lo is going to address that. Yes, I, I wanted to uh, to thank you all uh, for joining us today. We had a great uh, number of people who joined uh, to listen into this, this into this discussion. It was a great discussion. Uh, thank you to our four panelists for sharing their expertise and insights uh, on the future direction of of tech uh, and and particularly for for chemists and chemical engineers in tech. Uh, it was wonderful to hear. So thank you, Steve, June, Laura, and Michael for your for extending your uh, expertise and insights to us. We hope you'll uh, join us for future Berkeley Ecosystems events. Again, we, we, we record each event, we post them, we keep them online. You can check them all out on ecosystems.berkeley.edu. Um, as a quick reminder, please take the survey when you, that you will receive uh, momentarily. 
provide us feedback on this discussion, but also uh, give us some ideas of future topics that might be of interest to you. We will um, post any last questions that we didn't get to uh, to the speakers, and we can share those out to uh, all those that attended today. But otherwise, uh, we, we also invite you to connect with our speakers uh, through LinkedIn. Uh, would be a great way to connect with them. So we hope to see you again. And until then, from Berkeley, we always say, go Bears. Go, go Bears. 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 <laughs>